You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Good evening, everybody. It is so wonderful to be back here at Muster Monday. We are in the process of studying the teachings of Ramchal in the book Mesilat Yesharim, which is the path of the just. And we are in the middle of the conversation about pleasure and about the purpose of life. The purpose, and we mentioned this many times before, the purpose of our life is for, is pleasure. It's the one thing that every single human being on planet Earth desires. We all desire the same thing. Pleasure. Those who are sadists, you know why they want to hurt themselves? Because that's their interpretation. of. They both consider that pleasure. And that's, that's obviously something wrong with them. But either way, their whole desire is, is for pleasure. Um, there are people who, uh, who, uh, cheat in business because that's what gives them pleasure. It's the thrill. It's the excitement. That's what gives them pleasure. You have the same thing with, uh, people in, uh, in, 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 in sports. They're willing to work hard and, and, uh, sweat and cry and break bones for the pleasure of that competition. So anybody who tells you, well, why should I do that? It's not pleasurable. Obviously never worked hard for any type of accomplishment because anyone who succeeded in any major uh, accomplishment in life knows that you need to work really, really hard to get there. We need to work really, really hard to get there. And the harder we work, the more we'll enjoy it when we actually succeed. Nothing worthwhile comes easy. Right, we all agree? Nothing worthwhile comes easy. If it comes easy, perhaps it might not be worthwhile. Anybody here uh, blessed with a beautiful relationship or a great marriage? Is there anybody here who will say that it's, it was easy to get there? No. It was very difficult. A lot of hard work. So this is the basic explanation of man's purpose in this world. There is, however, a deeper understanding of the matter. Like we mentioned previously... The reason we came to this world is for pleasure. What is the ultimate pleasure? And by the way, I will just, uh, I'll give a plug here for Rabbi Milstein's class that he gave on December 25th on Xmas Day. We had a marvelous program here. And uh, his second class, his second lecture was about the five levels of pleasure. And as he mentioned <clears throat> so beautifully, and I, I, I recommend all of our friends out there to watch it online. Uh, either on Facebook or on YouTube. You can look at it. It's called The Five Levels of Pleasure. Any pleasure that's not an authentic fifth star, five star pleasure, too much of that pleasure will cause you pain. To give you my example, a simple example, everybody here knows I love barbecue potato chips. Uh, I almost have never found the barbecue potato chips I didn't fall in love with. But... Try to eat a whole bag, a whole family-sized bag of barbecue potato chips, and you'll feel sick to your stomach. You'll start getting dizzy, and uh, the, the day is over, okay? So even though it's a wonderful pleasure, but it's a pleasure that too much of that pleasure will cause you pain. Try any such type of pleasure. It is, it is fleeting, and it is not long-term, okay? And too much of it will only give you an ache. An authentic pleasure, the more the merrier. You see, for example, we have, uh, it's funny, someone, who was this who was telling me? This is not someone who's Shomer Shabbos. And he told me, he says, Rabbi, I just discovered the importance of stopping with technology, stopping with all of my business, stopping, he says, because I was just overloading myself with so much work. I didn't have a chance to just live. And he decided that he's going to observe a Shabbos without his phone, without his computer, without his, you know, his work, without the, without going to the bank, without going shopping, without doing anything, without worrying about his car, not even car washing it, nothing. Just taking some time out. And the transformation that one feels 25 hours of being completely disconnected, it does miraculous things for a person. Aside for the fact that if you're at my house, and you're all welcome, you'll have the most amazing food also. So, 
along with all that break, to also have really good food. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Comes the end of Shabbos, and people don't want it to end. They don't want it to not because they don't want to get back into reality. It's just that awesome pleasure. You know who calls Shabbos pleasure? The Torah. The Karasala Shabbos Oneg, and you will call the Shabbos Oneg a pleasure. A real pleasure, an authentic pleasure. A fifth level pleasure. You know what you do on Shabbos? Shabbos is a time of bonding. Bonding with your family, bonding with your spouse, bonding with your community. But most of all, and more important than everything, bonding with the Almighty. See, God understands this. By the way, it coincides with what was happening in Egypt. In these week's Torah portions that we're reading last week and this week and the week before last and next week, the Jewish people are enslaved in Egypt. What's the problem with slavery? The problem with slavery is that you don't have a mind of your own. You don't have any freedom. You can't think for yourself. You know why? Because you are enslaved to someone else. And when you're enslaved to someone else, you know what happens? They decide what you do and when you do. They decide if you get a rest. They decide if you're going to eat, if you're going to drink, if you're going to sleep. And part of, by the way, part of the plagues, as we discussed Shabbos morning in our class uh, at Congregation Beth Ramah, our prayer experience, we spoke about some of the plagues, all of the plagues actually, were a direct midah keneged midah, an eye for an eye, for the extra labor that the Egyptians inflicted on the Jewish people. So they used to tell them, hey, hey, you know what, Jew boy, can you do me a favor? We, we want to play with some frogs. Do you mind going out in the field and go get, get, get us from, some frogs? Go into the forest and get us some lizards and some snakes so we can play with them. It was a way to humiliate the Jews. So why did God pick frogs intentionally, that frogs should be the punishment on the Egyptians, one of the, one of the ten plagues? Because that's what they did to the Jewish people. They, they used to also make the Jewish people walk all the way down to the river and schlep water for them. What was the first thing that affected them? The water. They used to make the Jewish people dust their houses. They sweep their houses. So what did God say? I'm going to give you lice. The lice were like the dust. Everywhere was lice. Anything that was lice, that was dust, became lice. What did Moshe negotiate with Pharaoh? Brilliantly. Moshe negotiated with Pharaoh. And in, in, if you, re- you read the regular text, you don't see this, but if you read the Midrash, you see that every plague, Pharaoh was able to, was, was, was convinced to release the Jewish people of one level of bondage. For example, in this week's portion, we see that Pharaoh finally gets to his senses and releases the Jewish people and says, you guys can go. But before he does that, he says, fine. Seventh plague. Okay, it's about to be the eighth plague. He says, you know what? The men can go, but the women and children, they can't go. Moses says, With our youth, with our elders, with our men, with our women. So, so Pharaoh says, after that plague, he says, okay, 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 Moses, come back here. Ninth plague. He says, now, you can go with the women, with the children, but you can't take your cattle. Moses says, no, 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 no it's not going to work like this. We're also taking the cattle. Right? We're also, why? Because the Jewish cattle weren't affected by the plagues. Remember all of those that died from boils and all of those that died from the hail? It didn't happen to the Jewish animals, to the Jewish own animals. It only happened to the Egyptian animals. So now they needed some animals. Who are they going to buy it from? From the Jews. They said, no, 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 keep your cattle here. Moses says, no. They're coming with us too. <clears throat> Until all of the choice was taken away from from Pharaoh. But what did Moses negotiate in the beginning? Moses negotiated Shabbos. How did he persuade Pharaoh to allow the Jewish people to rest on Shabbos? He says, you know something? We all know that it's not good for someone to work 24-7, 365 days a year. We all know that's terrible, right? Moses, I have a great idea. Why don't you make them work for six days? Six days, work, work, work. 
On the seventh day, they should take a break. That way, they'll be more re-energized for the other six days. Pharaoh says, I like that. Right? And Moses, of course, picks the day of Shabbos to be that day of rest. And that was part of his negotiation, slowly chipping away, getting the Jewish people the privileges that they uh, deserved and needed. But Shabbos already started. Shabbos is a day of absolute pleasure on every level. So let's see here what the Ramchal tells us on another another under, way of understanding, uh, a, a deeper understanding of this matter. When you examine the matter further, you will see the true perfection, which is the ultimate good, is only the cleaving to Hashem. Okay, the closer one is to Hashem, the more pleasure they will have in their lives. This is what King David says in Psalm 7328. But as for me, you want to know what's good for me? Closeness to Hashem is my good. Closeness to God. You know what I know what's good for me? This is what King David defines as good. Closeness to Hashem. <clears throat> That's my perfection. The cl- this is what, what King David and all of our uh, matriarchs and patriarchs, this is the way they define their closeness, their, their, their perfection in life. How close were they to the Almighty? The closer they were to the Almighty, the more they considered their life perfect. Okay? It's always a very good barometer. Don't measure your success in life. By the way, <clears throat> something that those of you who come to this class regularly know ticks me off is when people talk about other people and say, oh, you know that? Very successful. Right? Very successful. They're usually referring to someone who has money. That's not success. I know way too many people who were successful financially but were unsuccessful with raising a family, unsuccessful in marriage, unsuccessful in many other areas of life. Is that what we call success? We just Is it all money? Success is someone who's able to nurture beautiful relationships, someone who's able to raise a family, someone who's able to to, to to build love and harmony, peace and harmony in their home. Someone who has a beautiful, loving relationship with their children. Is someone successful because they have money, but they haven't spoken to their sister or brother for the past 10 years? Is that success? Why are we limiting ourselves to what we call success just for money? I think it's something which is important for us to redefine what it is to be successful. According to King David, do you know what success is? Someone who has close Nastasha. Do what's right, even if it's unpopular. And there are many times, there are many, many times that we collectively may be in situations where we're saying, you know something? I just want to do something maybe to be a little bit more liked by other people. And that might cause me to maybe not be as religious as I think I maybe should? You know, what are my neighbors going to say? What are my friends going to say? What is my synagogue going to say? You know, all of my society people, what are they going to say? They can say, oh, he, 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 he went off the deep end, huh? right? <laughs> that guy went off the deep end because, you know, he's no, he's no longer driving on Shabbos. He's not one of us cultured people. That, is that what we're considering success? Or is it, were we considering success our relationship with Hashem? I, I must, I'm, I'm going to talk here for a second about someone who's sitting in our presence who, who after a, a terrible car accident, after, <clears throat> after a terrible car accident, his wife, I'm not going to say the name because uh, we're on, online, it's people in the class, it's a more intimate setting. Sorry, friends, you come to class and you'll see. Uh, <laughs> so, so people could start coming in now. But after, after a terrible accident and your wife passed away, so the, one of the rabbis in our community came to visit our fellow classmate many times at the hospital, every day at the hospital. 
And when, when our fellow classmate was leaving the hospital, he asked the rabbi, he says, what can I do to memorialize my wife and her neshama? The rabbi said, there's nothing you can do more than keep Shabbos. And that was the last time, the last time that our fellow classmate experienced, uh, the first, sorry, it was the first time and has never changed since the observance of Shabbos. There's nothing that is a greater pleasantness for God than the observance of Shabbos. You know, there's a song, I was. I, I don't know why, but I've been singing this song the whole day today and yesterday, but it's, 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 a, it's words that we, that we may know from perhaps prayers or from, you know, liturgy. It says, Matana tova gnuza bebeis gnuzai. God says to Moses, I have a great gift in my treasure house. And I desire to give it to the Jewish people. Vishabbos Shema. And its name is Shabbos. And God instructs Moses to tell them, the greatest gift, the most beautiful gift, the most pleasurable gift you can possibly imagine, God is willing to give it to us. But it's a treasure. we got to be careful. We have to treat it right. We have to take care of it. Like I've said numerous times at my Shabbos table, my wife tells me, please, please, you got to stop saying that. But the Midrash <laughs> says a very interesting thing. The Midrash says that Sunday was married to Monday, and Tuesday was married to Wednesday, and Thursday was married to Friday. And Shabbos came and complained to Hashem and said, it's not fair. Everybody has a mate. I don't have a mate. It's not fair. So God says, don't, don't, don't worry. Your mate is going to be the Jewish people. The Jewish people are going to dress up for you. The Jewish people are going to buy flowers for you. The Jewish people are going to cook the finest delicacies for you. The Jewish people are going to sing for you. They're going to stop all of their other activities. What does a, a, a wife want more than anything from her husband? Attention, just spend time with me. Right? Stop at the phone, stop at the... Now, that's Shabbos. That is Shabbos. Shabbos, what we're doing is we're turning off the entire world to focus on our relationship. And that's why Friday night when we're in synagogue, we all turn around towards the back at one point by L'chadodi, right? Boi v'shalom, right? What, 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 what are we turning around for? Well, that's the queen. When a bride walks into the room, what do we all do? We all stand up and face the back, face, face the bride as she walks to the, uh, to the chuppah, to the canopy. You know who's walking in Friday night? That's our bride. That's our Shabbos. We're married to Shabbos. There's no greater pleasure on planet Earth than Shabbos. What is Shabbos? Shabbos is that absolute relationship with God, uninterrupted. We don't have interruptions of anything. There's only one interruption that's allowed, and that's life matters. Right? If someone's about to die and you need to take them to a hospital, then you get in your car and you drive them to the hospital because life comes first. But otherwise, nothing else. Not picking up the cleaners and not the movies and not, nothing, 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 nothing. We do that before Shabbos, we do it after Shabbos, not on Shabbos. Okay. And then King David says another verse. In Psalms 27.4, he says, Achat sha'alti Hashem akesh. One thing I ask of Hashem that I seek that I dwell in the house of Hashem all the days of my life to behold the sweetness of Hashem and to contemplate in his sanctuary. In sanctuary meaning in his closeness, in that relationship with God. Kirak zehu hatov. For only this attachment to him is the true good. So we're looking for what is that true pleasure? What is that? I give me the ultimate ecstasy of pleasure. Right? You know what it is? That closeness with Hashem. Okay, so now we're talking a lot in, 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 uh, in spiritual terms. Okay, being close to Hashem. What does that really, really mean to be close to Hashem? <clears throat> what does it mean to be in a relationship with God that's not compromised by anything? And that it's a fifth level pleasure. 
וכל זולת זה שיחשבו בני אדם לטוב, while anything else that people consider to be good, אינו אלא הבל ושב נטעה. is nothing but futility and deceptive nothingness. אמנם לכשיזכה אדם לטובה הזאת, however, in order for man to merit this true good of becoming attached to Hashem, the source of true perfection, ראוי שיעמור ראשונה וישתדל ביגו לקנותה. He says like this, It is fitting that one should first toil and endeavor through his own efforts to acquire it. V'hayno, right, what does that mean? שישתדל לדבק בו יתברך. This means that he should endeavor to attach himself to Hashem in this world. To attach ourselves to Hashem in this world. בכוח המעשים שתולדתם זה העניין. Through the power of our actions that bring about the result of making a person close to Hashem. So what actions can a person do that brings us closer to God? Acts of kindness. What else can we do in this world right here to be closer to God? Sadaka, prayer, mitzvahs, mitzvahs <coughs> Torah study, repentance. All of these things are the correct answer. So let's define it. Let's bring it down one step simpler than, 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 than all of these, uh, than all of these names of, of, of actions, okay? What does it mean when someone does a mitzvah? Right, so a mitzvah means, what is a sin? A sin is an action that a person does that distances themselves from God or godliness. What is a mitzvah? Is an action that a person does that brings them closer to Hashem. Every mitzvah that a person does brings them closer to Hashem. Every sin that a person does takes them further away. Now, it's interesting that a sin really gets two punishments. It gets two punishments. Number one, for the sin. But number two is what could you have been doing during that time of that sin? You could have been doing a mitzvah. So number one, you forgo the mitzvah. Number two, you did the sin. Right? It's like when you travel the wrong direction. Right? You're supposed to go towards Austin and you end up going towards Beaumont. What happens? Every mile you travel, you have to go back two. Right? Because you're traveling one there and one back. Right? Yes. When a person does a sin, what they're doing is they're going one way away from God and they have to go another one back closer to get closer, to just get back to the evil, to, to the, to the, uh, to the level playing field. Right? It's, 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 it's a scary thought. Now, let's just talk for a second about the following statement. I've heard this. I remember when I was going, when I was in Israel, living in Israel. So I'd always like to schmooze with my cab drivers, many of whom were not, uh, not religious Jews. And I'd like to, you know, schmooze with them. It happens to be that some of them became my really good friends. And over the years, I would, I would call them and they would, uh, you know, they would be my, like my private, uh, private, uh, yeah, my private taxi, right? Um, so they always had a common, a common theme. They said, listen, why do I need to keep the Torah? Why do I need to keep the Shabbos? What's, why can't I just be a good person? I'm just a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't kill anybody, right? I pay my taxes. I'm just a good person. Why is that not good enough? So, that may be good enough. Let's define what it means to be a good person. Does good person mean that I just make myself feel good, that I'm doing enough for myself? Or does good person mean that I'm doing enough to be selfless? Now, on top of being selfless, what am I doing to elevate myself? Because if we really want to get on a higher connection on, of being godly, we have to elevate ourselves, constantly be in a, in a mode of growth. What am I doing to elevate myself? Because by elevating myself, what I'm doing is not just being a good person. I'm elevating all of those around me. I'm going to inspire all of those around me. So it's not just me being a good person. My whole community becomes, my whole community doesn't necessarily mean the entire city of Houston, but all of the people who are in direct contact with me get elevated. 
by my inspiration, by my growth. That means my children, it means my spouse, it means my neighbors, it means my friends. They all know, you know what, I'm not going to eat shrimp anymore. Right? I'm taking a step. And you know what? That might inspire them. So, at any level that a person's at, their pursuit of greatness, of godliness, is not only good for themselves, but it's also good for their entire community. Every time you have a desire and urge to do something that God says not to do, and you withstand that urge, you get the greatest reward you can possibly imagine for that. Now, it all depends on where someone comes from. We actually spoke about this Shabbos morning. Everyone has their point of challenge. I'll give you an example. Someone who's endeavoring or is on the mission to change their eating habits to start eating kosher. So they say, you know what? I'm only going to eat. I'm going to try my best to keep kosher. Comes three o'clock in the afternoon and they're in their office. And they say to themselves, you know what? I'm really hungry. I'm really hungry. And they start, is this Timmy Chan's? Or is this Whataburger, right? And they're thinking to themselves, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I should just go, right? I I really want to get myself a burger right now. But we know it's not kosher. That burger is not kosher. So that person is faced with a point of challenge where them overcoming that challenge will be rewarded so greatly, it's, it's imaginable. However, okay, I grew up, eating kosher my whole life. I never in my life had the urge or desire to eat a cheeseburger. Okay, I never did. So I'm going to come up to the heavenly courts and after 120, hopefully. So we come up to the heavenly court and and I say, hey, what do what, what you guys do to David? Well, oh, David, he refrained from eating uh, eating non-kosher, so he got a very big reward. I'm going to say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know where the torch center is? It's right down the block from McDonald's. And guess what? I never ate it. (laughs) Never. Once. Never. They'd be like, so? (laughs) So what? I'm like, he got a reward. Why don't I get that reward? Like, because it was never a challenge for you. You understand? It was never a challenge. If it's not a challenge for you, you're not going to get the same reward for it. For someone who has tasted it can say that. Someone who didn't taste it thinks there still is something there. Right? And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you like this. You, you watch uh, football games and you see that, how they drop that cheese on that, on that, on that, uh, on, uh, right? Oh yeah. Right? So you say to yourself, whoa, maybe there is something good out there. No, 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 no. Now obviously there's no dis- uh, person. And by the way, Rashi says something very interesting. Rashi in Leviticus says, the great commentator Rashi says, that one should not say about non-kosher food, ugh, it's disgusting. He said, no, don't say that. He says, say, you know something? I really wish I could eat it, but Hashem said I can't. On the contrary, the commentaries say that everything that is forbidden to us is permitted to us through a Torah way. For example, and the Talmud brings this example, the pig, right? There is a type of fish that tastes exactly like pork. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'm not even interested in knowing what it is. But there is an alternative, and there's nothing wrong with someone pursuing that in a kosher way. Right? I'll give you, I'll give you another example, okay? Some people think that, um, you know, they see, you see on, in the media, you see a very fake world. Hollywood is a fake world of what love is. There's a fake world of what, uh, of what, uh, you know, what it means to have an intimate relationship, right? It's all, and sometimes people get, get, uh, taken by that, like, oh, the religious people, they, they don't know how to have uh, intimacy and they don't know how to have a close relationship with their spouse. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. The Torah gives us more clarity on this area than any of the movies, any of the books, and any of the, of the, uh, uh, uh of the Hollywood can imagine. But there's one difference. One is done behind closed doors in privacy. And one is trying to make it, uh, you know, a public scene. There's the, the, and one is holy and one isn't. It's that we need to, to uh, understand that God doesn't want us to suffer. And by observing the Torah properly, we will never, 
ever, ever miss out. And there's a verse that I have to prove it from King David, where he says, Vidor she Hashem lo yachsuru koltov, and those who seek Hashem will not lack anything. Nothing. You will not lack anything. Lo yachsuru koltov, any goodness in the world, you will not lack because of your desire to connect to Hashem on a higher level. On a higher level. All right. So he says like this: while anything else that people consider to be good is nothing but futility and deceptive nothingness. However, in order for man to merit this true good of becoming attached to Hashem, the source of all true perfection, it is fitting that he should first toil and endeavor through his own effort to acquire it. We have to work on acquiring it. It's not going to come easy. We said before, it's going to come with just an interesting observation uh, King Solomon tells us, Sheva yipol tzaddik vikam. Seven times the righteous will fall and stand up again. Seven times. You fall, you know, think of a little, a little baby. My little daughter just started walking a few months ago. And when she started walking, she tried to stand up and get her balance and she'd fall. So if we would just give up after one time, we would never learn to walk. But children are resilient. They want to learn how to walk. So they fall and they get up again, and they fall and they get up again, and they fall and they get up again. Anything worthwhile, we stand up and try it again. If our desire is to have a true perfection in life, a true pleasure in life, and a true relationship with Hashem, it's worth all of the toil in the world and all of the failures that lead to the ultimate true success. Through the power of of action that bring about the, this result of making a person close to him, heim, heim, hamitzvot. And these are, these actions are specifically the mitzvot, the commandments. Thus, the mitzvot are not merely methods for acquiring one's place in the world to come. Rather, their fulfillment bonds a person to Hashem, and that attachment is the ultimate perfection, which is the primary reward that a person receives for his efforts. So, there are a couple of points here. The first point is as follows. There are many mitzvahs that a person can observe and observe them out of total habit. A person can do the same mitzvah over and over and over and over again, and it has no meaning anymore. Or, a person can stop a second before they do it, whatever that mitzvah is. Let's say it's the mitzvah of saying a blessing before we eat. Or the mitzvah of... uh, you know, any any mitzvah you can think of, the mitzvah of prayer, the mitzvah of putting on tefillin, the mitzvah of putting a mitzvah on our door, the mitzvah of reading the Torah, of studying the Torah. Do you know that there's a prayer that we're supposed to say before every mitzvah? There's a blessing. You know, I, I've, I've mentioned this numerous times. I'll repeat it because I think it fits very, very well to what we're talking about here. You know, the Talmud tells us that one who does not say a blessing prior to eating food, prior to enjoying from this world, is considered a thief. We've discussed this many times. Considered a thief. Why a thief? I didn't steal anything. So the idea behind this is that you're a thief, you're stealing from yourself. You're about to bite into an apple and you don't stop to appreciate how lucky you are to have an apple? You know what you just stole? You just stole from yourself an opportunity to be happy. You just stole from yourself an opportunity for perfection. You just stole from yourself the ability to be happy and to be fulfilled and satisfied. Instead, you just gobbled it up and goodbye. A person who does any mitzvah has the opportunity to do that mitzvah, the mitzvah of putting on a talit. It's a mitzvah. You're surrounding yourselves with yourself with, with godliness. You know, just interesting. You know, we have the word tzitzit. Anybody know what the numerical value of the word tzitzit? Tzadik yud, tzadik yud taf. Tzadik is 90, yud is 10. That's 100. So you do that twice. Tzadik yud and tzadik yud, it's 200. And taf is 400. So it's a numerical value of? 600. Now, if you take tzitzit... You have how many strings do you have? Eight strings. 
How many knots do you have? One, two, three, four, five. Five knots. Eight strings. That's how much? Thirteen. The name tzitzit with the five knots and the eight strings? 613 mitzvah. By fulfilling the mitzvah of wearing tzitzit, we have the entire Torah wrapped on ourselves, on our body. So we can put on tzitzit every day and just put them on. We're doing a mitzvah. Or we can have in mind, you know something? I'm not just putting on tzitzit. I'm incorporating the entire Torah on me. Now tell me who's going to have a different day. Someone who thinks about that and gets into the presence of mind. That now they have the entire 613 commandments along with them as their shield throughout the day. The verse says, oh, it's just another garment that I was trained to put on when I was three years old. So, every mitzvah, it's not only the performance of the mitzvah. The, it's not the quantity of how many mitzvahs we observe. But it's the quality of how we observe those mitzvahs. And all of the beauty of our, of our relationship with God depends not on the, on the, uh, quantity, but on the quality. How much are we going to be able to bring our relationship to the next level? Through quality service of Hashem. And the more we have intention, the more we have thought, the more we have preparation for the mitzvah that we're about to observe, the greater that relationship is going to be st- strengthened through the observance. Are there any questions about this? We're good. It's clear. It's amazing, no? I think it's amazing. If a person stopped, you know what, we light shot, think of any mitzvah that you do on a regular basis. Any mitzvah. Did you ever have, did anybody ever wear a very, something that, a, a, a garment that they have always wanted to wear. They always wanted to. You wanted those pairs of pair of shoes, and you're like, "Oh, I can't wait to get that shoes. I finally have enough money to buy that purse, right?" Anybody or or a car? Anybody here, right? You buy that new car, and you're like, "Oh, right, I'm so excited about this, right?" Right? Anybody have that? Anybody have a show me show of hands? You've had that experience of something new, something unique, something special. It's a watch. It's a piece of jewelry. It's something. And we all felt probably the same feeling. Ah, I'm never going to get sick of this, right? I'm never, ever going to... This feeling of like, it's just so incredible. It's so amazing. It can never wear off on me. Transitory. (laughs) And it lasts a day, two days, a week, a month. And done. On with the next thing. There's one way to stop that. Focus. Focus every day. You're about to get into that new car. You're about to wear those new shoes. Ah, thank you, Hashem, for giving me this special gift. Don't just say it as a habit. That can also become a habit. But to to appreciate, we can live in a world of total pleasure if we just stopped living and started experiencing and started feeling and connecting to what it is we're living. Two different worlds. Let's, uh, let's review here, and maybe we'll have some time to go uh, further. All right? So every mitzvah has the potential of elevating. By the way, it can even be one mitzvah. It can even be one mitzvah that transforms a person's life. We see this in the Talmud. The Talmud relates that someone who experienced one experience of teshuvah, of repentance, one a heavenly voice came out and said, you're welcome to the world to come. The sages were crying. They're like, what? We're trying our whole lives to get to this point of perfection so we can receive our place in the world to come. This guy slips in with one mitzvah. Boom, he's gone. He's got it. Right? It's like people who are playing golf their whole lives. Right? Trying to get that hole in one. And this whippersnapper comes out of eighth grade and goes, boom. Gets his hole in one. He's like, guys, so long. I'm out, right? <laughs> the Midrash says something very, very interesting. It says that when Moses ascended up to the seven, seventh uh, firmament, uh, what happened was is that each firmament that he ascended, he was met by a group of angels. 
And the lowest uh, firmament, the first firmament, was lowest ranking angels. Again, these are heavenly angels already as is, but of the of the heavenly angels, this was the lowest ranking ones. And he hears them reciting the first day of creation. And then they start praising the Jewish people. Then the next firmament's higher ranking angels, and they say the second day of creation, and then they start praising uh, the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And each firmament successively is higher ranking angels, and they read the next day of creation, and they praise another one of the qualities. On the seventh firmament, the highest level, there's reading about the Shabbos, which is the seventh day of creation, and the highest ranking angels, and then they stop and they praise the greatest gift ever given to mankind. Teshuvah repentance. So you can ask this question, I don't understand. More than Shabbos, more than the land of Israel, more than the Jewish people, more than uh, more than Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, more than Gehinnom, right, which is all one of those seven. The highest of all levels is Teshuvah repentance. You know why? It's very simple. Because all of those other things, whether it's the Torah, whether it's the land of Israel, whether each one of those things, what is their goal? To bring a person to a clarity, to bring a person to a place of a strong relationship with God. What is Teshuvah? Teshuvah is that relationship. Teshuvah is that clarity. Teshuvah means, I rec- oh my goodness, I cannot believe it. You mean? It's like imagine, right, a, a students uh, in this class are, 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 are playing a prank on their teacher. Not realizing that the principal is standing in the back of the classroom. I had that once in ninth grade. <laughs> right, the principal slipped into the back of the room and the kids pulled a prank on the teacher and the principal was standing right there. What happens? A little shameful moment there, right? I wasn't the troublemaker, so it wasn't me, right? But but um, it's a little bit of a shameful moment, right? You know why? Because he saw everything that went on, everything that went on. That's a little embarrassing. Imagine that we suddenly realize that God saw everything we did, everything. He was right there. How do we feel? (gasps) You mean he saw that and Hmm. he saw that and he saw what I said there and he saw the way I acted there and he saw, (gasps) so embarrassed, I'm humiliated. Oh my goodness, Hashem, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I didn't realize you were right there. That's true teshuva. True repentance means I recognize I've gone the wrong way. I didn't even realize how far I went. I didn't realize... I now have that clarity of your presence right there. You're right in the room. If I would have known, I would never have done it. Hashem is always there. You know, people, you know, right up there, there's a camera. See the camera right up there? Right? So wave, say hi, because you're all on camera, right? So, so, but, 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 you know what? We're all on camera 24-7. You know, I was by Walmart. Over here, uh, at the grocery, at the neighborhood Walmart, and uh, I scanned an item. I guess I scanned it a little bit too fast, and it replayed for me on the screen a shot from a camera right on top of me. You see me from right on top <laughs> scanning the item. You see it. And I actually did a video about that, of how God records everything. God doesn't need hard drives. He doesn't need a cloud. He doesn't need any of the, right? It, God has been recording it since day one. Imagine, you know, uh, the president announced that he's going to be doing an Oval Office address tomorrow. So you can imagine there are going to be cameras upon cameras and, and, and microphones and you're going to have uh, commentators and you're going to have uh, all these different, right? The second the president comes out, you see, you, if you see any president, there are hundreds of mics there. Everyone, oh, Mr. President, everyone's asking questions. Right? Everyone's yelling till, till he picks, okay, you. And still people are yelling. Do you know that when we do something, like the thousands of mics 
the cameras, they're all on us. We are that president. We are that person. And all of those tapes are recording. They're recording the words that we say. And that in our own private conversations with people, you think that because other people didn't hear, I could be obnoxious. No, the, the Mishnah teaches us. Even the smallest conversation in private is recorded. Everything. And you know who's the ultimate judge at the end of the day? Of course, Hashem. But you yourself. You are your judge. God's going to show us, when we pass away, He's going to show us a footage of a, a movie. Everyone's going to sit back at their popcorn. And God's going to say, oh, you came? Guess what? Right? David, you're going to be the judge. You're going to be the judge. Right? You're going to tell us how to... Uh, how to judge this person. And the person's not going to know that it's actually themselves that they're judging because the face is going to be blurred out. But you're going to be able to see what they were thinking, what they actually did, what they said. You'll be able to see all of the actual intentions and the focus, right? So the better we teach ourselves to become positive thinkers, to become positive judgers of other people, uh, to do positive actions the more we will train ourselves to judge ourselves favorably. The power of a mitzvah, the power of a mitzvah is so great that, you know what? It's worth being there for the mitzvah. The reward that one gets for doing a true mitzvah is greater than any imaginable reward. It says that one millisecond, one millisecond of the world to come now, okay, think one second of your world to come, each one as an individual, is greater than all of the pleasures collectively of every single human being. Imagine, everyone has, you know, 200 million ounces of pleasure. Right? Take all of those, each person, right? So then add the next person's 200 million, the next person's 200 million uh, ounces of pleasure. All of those pleasures combined does not equal one second of your olam haba, your world to come. Think about that. How do we get that? Through our godliness. Being godlike. We are called Adam, not only because we're taken from the earth, because we are Adam meh, because we are godlike. We are meant to be godlike. That's our purpose. Our entire function in this world is to be godlike. It's an unbelievable uh, opportunity that we have in this world. Every day you wake up, right? Technically, we should never be depressed in our lives. Why? You've, give, you've been given an opportunity. You've been given an opportunity to maximize pleasure, to maximize your relationship with God, to accomplish unbelievable things. A human being is unbelievable potential, unbelievable abilities. The problem is, is we've always li we limit ourselves. You know why we limit ourselves? Because we say, "Well, you think I could run faster than anybody else?" Hey, what's what's what is the first thing a parent tells their child when they say, "I'm going to go comp compete in the Olympics"? Ah, so many have tried that. You know how many have failed? They've all failed. A few people didn't, right? That's what everyone says. Oh, you want to become the next Jeff Bezos? You want to come become the next uh, uh, Bill Gates? You know what? Everybody's trying to be a billionaire. Good luck. And everyone's trying to down, down, uh, downplay your potential. But a person who really understands how much God invests in us, forget about money pursuits. Forget about uh, uh, materialistic pursuits, spiritual pursuits. Or oh, you're going to try to become a rabbi. Ah, by the way, that's much easier. It's much easier to become a rabbi, I promise, okay? You just have to want it. It's not as attractive as people making money. Because that's the way we've been nurtured throughout our society. It's always been, oh, oh, that's the, that's the rich family. Oh, okay, they can be, please, you know? The rabbi, the rabbi sit in the back. The rabbi can take a back seat. He can wait. The truth is, is that we all have unbelievable potential. If we only believed in ourselves as much as God believes in us, we'd be the most successful people on earth. True success. But that's what we're missing. We are missing 
our own belief in ourselves. And this is what the Ramchal is telling us here. You have to bring out you. You have to bring out your own potential to, 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 to make that relationship, to make that a connection with God a real one. Only we can do it. And you know what? You're going to be people who are going to say, eh, went off the deep end. Lunatic. Crazy. Closed-minded. What, are, what other titles am I missing about people who are religious, right? For they're from the dark ages. They haven't modernized. They're out of touch with reality. Fanatics. Yeah. They, oh, they think they're better than us. Mm. I heard that one. Self-righteous. The truth is, it, we have to give ourselves more credit than that. As a society, we have to look up to people who are holier, who are more spiritual, people who have overcome challenges and admire it. Let's not talk them down from it. Let's admire it and say, you know what, maybe I can be inspired to take a step, to change, to be more selfless, to be more God-like, to be more spiritual and less materialistic. So Hashem shall bless us all that we should all find that success in our spiritual pursuits. We should all live a life which is filled with true pleasure, authentic pleasure, and not, God forbid, get stuck in a world of counterfeit and fake mm. pleasures. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful evening. Drive safely. I look forward to seeing everyone here next week. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.